This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. I think a lot of people have no idea just how interconnected our world really is these days. How a drone strike in Saudi Arabia can increase the price of petrol by 20 cents here in Australia. Or how the war in Ukraine can cause instability and grain shortages right across countries as varied as Egypt, India, and Nigeria. Or how would one state collapses in one area, the effects of that collapse are felt by every single state around them, often then applying crippling pressure to those states' institutions. And nowhere is this problem more evident than what is currently going on in East Africa. Now, already we've seen how this region can have ideas and impacts spread quickly throughout these regional states. As already, this is an area of the world that has already seen how protests in Indonesia can kick off political movements in Egypt, or how a successful coup in Mali can inspire copycats in Niger, Gabon, and Burkina Faso. And whilst the collapse of any state in this region would cause problems no matter what, there's always been one country in this area in particular everyone has been the most worried about. One country who, if facing collapse, would cause massive instability throughout the region, with the country I'm referring to here being Sudan. Now, Sudan, here in the northeast of Africa, has for a long time been externally one of the more stable countries in the region, largely being due to the country having one heavy-handed leader to the next. So in the past, when we've seen previous civil wars in Sudan, like the war in Darfur or the fighting in what is now South Sudan, the entire region desperately tried to make sure that Sudan stayed upright, as all these states knew that if Sudan collapsed, it would mean up to 46 million refugees fleeing Sudan into those seven bordering nations. And this becomes particularly worrying at the moment, as each one of the seven states the Sudan borders is also currently going through a fair bit of turmoil, with their institutions already being pushed to the brink. If we go around Sudan's neighbors clockwise, starting with Egypt, their economy is hanging on by a thread at the moment, with massive bailouts already starting to try and keep the country afloat. And major cities like Cairo and Alexandria are currently experiencing massive shortages of even the basics like housing and food. So if we see collapse in Sudan, it's only going to put more pressure on the scarce resources in Egypt. Moving clockwise, Eritrea is also going through a period of political instability, pulling away from its recent de-escalations and instead beginning to return to a much more isolationist foreign policy. Next up, we'd have Ethiopia, who just finished up one civil war in the north of the country and has now fallen straight into another civil war in the south and west of the country, with Addis Ababa desperately worried as the previous combatants in Tigray are simply awaiting to see what deal they're offered by Addis before they decide whether or not to restart the previous round of fighting. A fight that Addis did not get out of easily last time. On top of that, further to the southeast, Kenya is currently experiencing problems with Al-Shabaab and drying up foreign capital, all of which being exacerbated as they can no longer rely on Ethiopian peacekeepers to try and keep things in check. Next up would be South Sudan, who itself is in the middle of its own long-running civil war only being made worse as what little oil money the country was making and relying on to push the economy along is now drying up, as most of South Sudan's oil still ran through pipelines in Sudan, out to the ports in the Red Sea, with those pipelines now crisscrossing the front lines of Sudan's civil war, preventing that one revenue lifeline that South Sudan was reliant upon. Another jump to the left, and we arrive in the Central African Republic, a country that is effectively embroiled in a 10-way civil war, and the Russian Wagner group now effectively calling the shots in the country. To the north, we have Chad, whose new leader is still struggling to find his feet here in the country, after taking office from his father, who died in somewhat mysterious circumstances. With the country's population desperate for the new leader to find his feet quickly, as frankly, N'Djamena is very much struggling to contain the growing militia movements around the Lake Chad Basin. And our last country to border Sudan is Libya, who itself is still deadlocked in its own civil war, fall to the brim of Sudanese mercenaries. Funnily enough, a lot of these forces who are fighting here in Sudan are either still fighting in, or frankly got their training, learned to fight, and now bringing those skills back to the war here in Sudan. With that war as well, also being funded by many of the same players funding this war here in Sudan. Each and every one of these seven nations is desperately trying to keep their house of cards standing up at the moment, and each and every one of them knows what is likely to happen if Sudan falls apart. And this is probably why more and more of these countries are now becoming increasingly involved in Sudan's civil war, with the likes of Egypt, the UAE, Russia, Ukraine, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Libya, Chad, and Kenya now all supporting one side or the other, 
with each one of these actors, seeking to have their chosen faction take ownership of the country, hopefully without knocking it over in the process. With frankly, so little of these actors actually taking into account probably the most important factor in this decision, the will of the Sudanese people, who, as we've seen, is being continuously tossed aside for the strategic goals of countries far outside its borders. Now, up until recently, state collapse here in Sudan seemed somewhat unlikely. After all, the country has survived multiple civil wars before. Yes, there had been a coup, and yes, the country was plunged into a civil war, but over the last summer in Sudan, things did seem to somewhat quiet down, and many assumed that Sudan was settling in for what we see right across the African continent, a low-intensity, grinding war with, with very little movement in the front lines, a situation that is frankly much easier to handle and predict for not only the government and the guys fighting the war, but also for outside powers looking to invest and do trade. However, just in the last few weeks, a third faction has now entered the war in force, and the government forces that were once keeping these paramilitary groups in check are now fleeing backwards toward the coast, with these paramilitary forces, who originally gave themselves the name of the Devils on Horseback, now barreling across the country at a speed almost unthinkable just a few weeks ago, with these forces now having secured multiple major cities across the country and all but a few pockets of the very capital, Khartoum itself, in just a few short weeks, what looked like a slow attritional war has become one that experts are now genuinely worried could collapse the Sudanese state itself. And yet with the Gaza conflict happening to the north, so many people seem to be missing the major story unfolding here in East Africa. So how do we arrive at this point? Why are there so many actors choosing to get involved here in Sudan? And what are the risks if either side actually is successful in their goals to conquer the country? These are just some of the questions we're going to be tackling here today. And to take us through the backstory and the latest developments, as well as how we got here, we turn to our first guest. Part one, a complicating conflict. So I think outsiders who haven't really ever engaged in Sudan kind of may be tempted to write Sudan off as a country which is basically just doomed to cycles of failure and irrelevant in terms of global politics. And I really think they just couldn't be more wrong. For the last five years, Sudan has actually been one of the frontline states in a fight we're seeing playing out across the world between autocracies and liberal democracy. And when we talk about the decline of democracy in the West, we usually talk about European states like Hungary or Poland. But I would argue that Sudan's fate is actually just as important. It will define not only Africa, but the Middle East as surely as it will the rest of the world. Will Brown is a senior associate of the Africa program at CSIS and a reporter for Tortoise Media. Will is a multi-award winning Africa correspondent, formerly based in Nairobi. And before joining The Telegraph, he was West Africa's correspondent for The Economist magazine, based in Dhaka, as well as a freelance journalist covering crimes in India. He's reported for more than two dozen countries specializing in Africa, and has been cited by everyone from Human Rights Watch to the US Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, as well as the UK and European parliaments, for his knowledge and expertise on conflicts within Africa. So we're thrilled to have him on the program today. It's this vast populous nation of 45 million people, which once jousted with Saudi Arabia for the crown of the ultra-conservative Islamic world. And until very recently, women were flogged by religious police if they dared to, to wear trousers. But then in 2018, we had this something really quite amazing. You know, students took to the street crying out for bread, democracy and liberty. And Omar al-Bashir's three decade old Islamist dictatorship was swept aside at the cost of hundreds of young Sudanese lives. And I think now, as we see smoke billowing out across Khartoum or these videos of bodies being shoved into mass graves in Darfur, those dreams of kind of this democracy on the Nile, they're dead. And I don't think anyone even bothered to write their obituary. Obviously, this is a very complicated situation, so it's probably in our best interest here to cover some background and bring everyone up to speed on how we arrived at this point in Sudan before we move on to what lies ahead for the country. Now, obviously, oversimplifying here, but Sudan has been ruled by a series of dictators for a very long time. In fact, almost the entire time since independence, with coups in 58, 69, and 85, followed by the ascension of a man named Omar al-Bashir, the former Sudanese military attaché to the UAE, who took power in Sudan in 1989. He would rule a country with an absolute iron fist, becoming one of the continent's most notorious dictators. For a lot of people though, he would only crack international attention in 2003, when we step up his conflict in the west of the country, against the non-Arab populations in the Darfur province. In the west, along the border with Chad, 
leading to what many people would classify as a genocide within the area. Now obviously this war was not universally popular right across Sudan, and Bashir would undergo widespread pressure from the international community for his actions here. But the war had to go on, and worried about pulling too many troops away from the capital where he could be protected, he instead empowered another group to fight his war in Darfur for him. The group he chose to empower being a local Arab militia known as the Janjaweed, or in English, the Devils on Horseback, with this group being led by a man known to most as Hameti. The Janjaweed would be very successful in their campaign in Darfur, and this force would prove invaluable to Bashir, with Hameti and himself becoming very close over the years. However, whilst this was all going on, and the Janjaweed were fighting in the west, the south of the country was also becoming a problem for Bashir and the government in Khartoum, with Bashir being forced to deploy the Sudanese Armed Forces, or SAF, to solve the problem, with the SAF being the country's conventional military. Now, the SAF would use an increasingly heavy hand here in the south as well, fighting what would become known later as the Second Sudanese Civil War. But with that war hurting both sides, and the increasing corruption within the SAF, the situation fighting against the people in Darfur and fighting against the people in South Sudan became almost untenable. So in 2011, with the Sudanese economy absolutely tanking and Bashir looking for a way to end the war, a US supported referendum was held in the mostly Christian South Sudan. That referendum being on a choice for South Sudan to secede from the rest of Sudan. The referendum would pass and South Sudan would become the newest independent nation in the world, reducing the amount of fighting the SAF had to conduct but also losing half the country in the process. And having seen half the country break away, and the economy still tanking, Bashir, the dictator, would begin to panic. And in fearing that there was another coup around the corner, he turned to the Janjaweed, who had proved themselves invaluable in their fighting in Darfur, making the group an official paramilitary force within the Sudanese armed forces, in exchange for his friend offering to protect Bashir in the event of an uprising. At the time, these forces would be assigned under the umbrella of the country's intelligence agency, and by 2013, would be reorganized and renamed the RSF, or Rapid Support Forces, with the Darfur campaign's leader, Hameti, being sealed at the helm. Now, as the economy continued to stagnate and protests continued to build in the country, Bashir would become increasingly paranoid, and in 2017, wouldn't even trust his intelligence services, pulling the RSF away from them and even closer to him, bringing Hameti even closer into his inner circle. And very soon, we had a situation with the RSF, led by Hameti, and the SAF, the Sudanese Armed Forces, now being led by Abdul Fattah al-Burhan, would now only directly answer to Bashir himself, and Bashir relying on these two militaries balancing each other out to prevent one of them deciding to launch a coup against him. In an effort to keep Burhan and Hameti loyal, Bashir would bequeath the country's robust domestic arms and telecom industry to the SAF and Burhan for him to use as his own piggy bank, and would then bequeath the country's rich gold mining resources to Hameti in the RSF for them to use as their piggy bank, so the two of them could make lots of money as long as they stayed loyal to Bashir. And for the both of them, this arrangement worked quite well, until 2019 rolled around, and the country seemed absolutely ready to explode with protests, as more and more of the country's national budget was earmarked towards security and defense rather than food or any aid for the people. Now Hameti and Burhan could see the writing on the wall, knowing that a full revolution was more than likely on the cards, and the two of them began to worry that they may not get as nice a seat at the table if the table gets completely reset. And so the two of them colluded to remove Bashir from power, hoping that if they removed him, the people would be happy enough with that, and they would allow Hameti and Burhan to continue doing what they were doing. And so, on April 11th, 2019, the two of them launched a coup to remove Bashir from power. And whilst this was welcomed by the general public, understandably, these reforms didn't go far enough, and it didn't satisfy what the population was looking for. Now add on top of that, the numerous governments beginning to put pressure on the two of them to bring in some civilian representation. So, the SAF and the RSF relented and allowed the creation of what was known as the Transitional Council, where the military would rule Sudan for 21 months and then the civilian government would rule for 18 months. Also making the SAF's Burhan the chair of the council and the RSF's Hameti the deputy chair of the council. But as much power as this council had, the civilian government would still be led by a civilian. That civilian being Abdullah Hamdok, a former senior official with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, who in 2019 would begin his role as Sudan's Prime Minister, with many people happy to see his appointment to the role. But whilst Hamdok had come into the role and tried to repair some of the damage that had been done to the country over the years, Burhan and Hameti began plotting the next moves. With Burhan and the SAF cozying up to Europe, Egypt and the Middle East, and Hameti and the RSF 
cozying up to the UAE, Russia, and China. And the two sides began squirreling away relationships, money, and weapons for what both of them viewed as an inevitable upcoming clash. And whilst tension sat in the air, Burhan chose to make the first move, with the SAF launching a coup against the civilian government in 2021, demanding more power be given to the Sudanese armed forces and forcing Hamdok to sign a new deal writing that into power, with some reporting that that deal was even signed at gunpoint. Hamdok, trying to retain some sort of civilian rule within this government, did sign the deal, but realized that the situation was effectively hopeless and would eventually resign on January 2nd, 2022, meaning the power in the country would default back to the head of the Transitional Council, meaning Burhan and the Sudanese Armed Forces. So with Burhan now the head of the country, and only one organization left to deal with, he would approach his deputy Hermeti, demanding the RSF would be absorbed into the SAF, and that Hermeti could remain his deputy, but he answered to Burhan, and that this entire transition would have to be completed within the next two years. Hermeti, obviously not happy with being absorbed by the SAF, would counter and suggest that the deal be done over 10 years, feeling that it may be enough time to restructure and prepare before it happens. Burhan, being the one with the planes and tanks, felt he was much stronger than the RSF, and in such pushed back against Hamedi's request, demanding that they remain to the two-year deadline. Hamedi would walk away from the table, and things would begin to set in motion. A few weeks later in February 2022, the RSF, many of whom soldiers had already served as mercenaries in either Yemen or Libya, would begin recruiting lots and lots of new soldiers, with these new recruits mostly based in the capital city of Khartoum or Marwi in the north of the country. Burhan and the SAF could see what was coming, and ordered the RSF forces to leave these cities and disperse immediately, but Hamedi refused, continuing to build up and mobilize. And then a few days later, on April 15th, the RSF would launch their attack on the SAF, attacking TV stations and numerous army bases and airfields right across Sudan, with the aim being to capture and kill Burhan and seize control of the country for Hamedi and the RSF. Fighting in the west, in the capital, and in the north was particularly nasty, all of this only being made nastier by outside powers becoming increasingly involved in the conflict, with Burhan and the SAF being backed by Egypt, some Iranian defense manufacturing, Saudi money, and Turkish support, as well as a handful of Ukrainian mercenaries, and Hermeti and the RSF being backed by the UAE, Russia, mostly through Wagner, the breakaway Libyan state led by Haftar, and small amounts of support from Chad and Kenya. And the fighting continued to intensify, with more and more of the capital city Khartoum falling to the RSF, and so Burhan would leave and set up a de facto command in the city of Port Sudan, on the northeast coast of Sudan, just below the border of Egypt. Now, some ceasefires would be attempted, and many would be killed on both sides. But things seemed to be drawing down to a stalemate, as both sides headed into the hot Sudanese summer. However, all of this was then complicated by a third faction entering the war, that faction being the SPLM, or Sudan People's Liberation Movement. This group, based mostly just to the north of the border between Sudan and South Sudan, would sense that there was a moment in time that they could achieve their goals, and would break the ceasefire between them and the government in Khartoum, launching attacks along the south of Sudan. These attacks would force the SAF to pull troops away from their front lines elsewhere, to go fight the SPLM forces in the south, ushering in a turning point for the war, as not long after this redeployment, the SAF front lines in Darfur and in the west, as well as the center of the country, all began to collapse with the RSF beginning to gain some serious territory going forward, even crossing the Nile and securing all but a few areas of the capital city Khartoum. And that momentum on the battlefield still seems to be very much in the RSF's favor at the moment. Which brings us up to where we are today, with Hameti and the RSF rapidly capturing more and more of the country, and Burhan and the SAF still being more internationally recognized as the leaders of Sudan, but losing ground right across the front, and unable to contain the RSF or the SPLM. And now that we have some idea of how we got here, well, how would you sum up the situation as it currently sits on the ground? The revolutions, coups and civil wars, they've come and gone. But Khartoum, that kind of great city on the Nile, the capital of Sudan, has always held. Uh, and elites played this very careful game, balancing off a, a Chadian warlord or a Libyan warlord off against each other, as they did with balancing Washington DC against Riyadh and Al-Qaeda. But what is happening in this conflict now in Sudan is all those kind of previous conflicts and push and pull factors on the periphery, they're still very much there. But all those fractures and breaks have come from the periphery into the center. And so Khartoum has fallen, it's been gutted, the center is broken, and there doesn't seem to be any obvious way towards peace for Sudan. So can you give us a bit of an understanding of the two main sides here in the conflict? 
So you've got two key forces in Sudan. One is easier to explain. It's the Sudanese Armed Forces, or the SAF. They're basically the, the standard armed forces, and much like in Egypt, they have a huge stake in their economy, particularly in agriculture, or at least they did before the, the civil war broke out. The SAF is run by a man called General Abdel Al-Bahan, and they're closely aligned to Cairo and to Sisi. Their power base, for one of a better term, is more in the center, the north, and the, 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 the east of the country. And then you've got this second force in Sudan called the Rapid Support Forces, or the RSF. And now this is basically a paramilitary force, which numbered about 100,000 before the civil war started. And they grew out of the murderous kind of Janjaveed militias in, in the Darfur genocide. They were basically Arab horsemen and gunmen who would go around massacring black ethnic Marsalit communities in Darfur during the genocide in the, in the early 21st century. Their base is more on the westerly Darfur side of the country, and they're run by this man called Hermeti, a former kind of cattle rustler highwayman who has risen up the ranks through the RSF to become one of the most powerful people in not just Sudan, but one of the most powerful people in Africa. And who would you say has the momentum in the fighting at the moment? In April 2023, if you were a betting man, your money would probably be on the SAF. The forces were pretty evenly matched, but the SAF, they had heavy armor. They had air forces, they had fighter jets, and this gave them near complete air superiority. The RSF had a lot of men, a lot of Kalashnikovs, a lot of RPGs, a lot of Toyotas, mounted machine guns, that sort of thing. They did have some advanced kit, but the SAF really seemed to have a bit more from what we could tell. Now that entire situation has radically changed. So basically the United Arab Emirates and Russia through its, its mercenary group, the Wagner Group, have been supplying huge amounts of equipment to the RSF. And I should say that the UAE denies this, but it's pretty clear they have. And what we've seen is that the RSF have got their hands on anti-aircraft missiles. This is basically cut off the SAF's air superiority, which has allowed the RSF to advance quite rapidly in a number of areas. The SAF has been getting some support from Egypt, including some airstrikes, but it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as much as Bahan probably would have wanted. And so the momentum is very much in the RSS favor right now. They're making huge gains around Darfur. Uh, they just took a key city called Wad Madini, which is southeast of, of Khartoum in the agricultural heartland of Sudan. And they seem to have captured the city after just four days, which gives you an indication of how quickly they're making strides forward. We did see the tempo of the fighting start to slow down over the summer, but now things are dramatically seeming to change. Do you see this as the new tempo or are things really starting to speed up now with the SAF pulling further and further back on their lines? It's very much speeding up. You had a series of different cities in Darfur which have fallen in the, over the last two months. And now you've seen Wad Madini fall. And by some estimates, something in the line of about 80% or 70% of the city of Khartoum, the capital, is under RSF control. And how does the fighting in, let's say, Khartoum compare to the fighting that we're seeing out in the west of the country? From talking to sources on the ground, is that the fighting in the west of the country is far more ethnic in its character. There are massacres that we know are happening where black ethnic Marsalit communities in Darfur are being rounded up and they're being murdered and shoved into mass graves. This is completely kind of almost act two of the Darfur genocide. It's a reenactment, basically. While the fighting around places like Khartoum seems to be much more the sort of horrific city fighting you'd be expecting from a war like this. We're getting kind of lots of reports of civilians being killed in the crossfire and also of mass rapes, gang rapes and things like this. So both sides have committed. We're seeing the RSF trying to whip up more of their ethnic base in Darfur to try and get more troops. And this is basically leading to an absolute flood of horrific attacks going on in the west of the country. And obviously, as journalists, you need to fact check and verify every incident amid this kind of wash of fake news and disinformation you see online. But make no mistake about it, what's going on is hellish. And just look at the reports coming out of Darfur. The UN is investigating at least 13 mass graves, which have been counted around the city of El Janir after the RSF and, and different allied Arab militiamen went on a rampage there. Just listen to the videos of these mass graves and the stories of refugees who are making it out of Darfur into neighbouring Chad. They're talking about every man in their village being slaughtered systematically. And one could assume that those impacted by the events will not be quick to forgive or forget these actions, which, as history shows us, means we're probably in for a much longer war than people expect. So how could it hope to be drawn to a close? If, let's say, the RSF are successful and do manage to take the rest of Khartoum, does that actually have any chance of ending the war? 
winning Khartoum is a huge victory in terms of symbolic victory, capturing the heart of the country. But I don't think the war will be over that quickly, simply because the SAF have got their rear operating bases in Port Sudan on the coast, more in the northeast of the country. I don't think Khartoum, while it obviously will give the RSF forces a, a tremendous morale boost, I don't think it will be the defining thing. Well, the RSF do have a few different factions and factors they would probably have to thank for their current successes. But in my mind, the primary out of all of these would likely be the UAE. So can you take us through what the UAE is offering the RSF and why they're so involved in this conflict here? The UAE sees Sudan in its backyard. Saudi Arabia does as well. So there's tremendous amounts of investment from Saudi and from the UAE. The RSF actually sent soldiers to fight as ground troops in Yemen for the United Arab Emirates. And Hameti in particular also has huge amounts of power because of his gold mining interests in the west of the country. He runs these huge gold mines there for a combination of Wagner and different Sudanese mining groups. And, and this gold is sent off to the UAE. And this kind of, kind of bankrolls Hameti. So the, the gold states have got their interests. You've also got different actors at play trying to flex their muscles. Russia has historically had quite close connections to Sudan. And the Sudanese elites have been very clever at playing off the West, dangling this idea of Russia getting a naval base on the Red Sea at Port Sudan, which Russia has been really, really keen for and has been really pushing for it for decades. So the Russians have an interest not only in gold mining, but also in strategic terms. If you look at a map of Africa, Wagner has its key influence, its key buildup of forces around the Central African Republic. And then in Mali, you can make a land route through to the Central African Republic through Sudan. And so they have been very, very heavily invested in the fate of what happens next. But Russia's wanted this port for years, and the UAE has been working with the RSF for nearly a decade. So why are we seeing this fighting all kicking off now? So there's no simple answer, but there are several big broad factors we can discuss. So climate change is the obvious one. This whole band of countries is effectively ground zero for global warming and areas which were already pretty tough to live in have become almost uninhabitable. And this obviously has knock-on effects. It breaks up traditions and pasturing rights, leads to more food insecurity. It means more internal migration flows, which can put pressure on different communities. Then you have very rapidly growing populations. These states struggle to provide basic services for their people. Well, having seen and reported on quite a lot of these sort of conflicts over the years, what would you recommend as a possible solution going forward? So first and foremost, there's got to be some sort of peace deal. But sadly, at the moment, that seems we're pretty far off. Right now, the RSF is making serious gains. It's not really in the interest for Tabata for peace. They're winning big, moving from city to city. And from what I've read and heard from different contexts is that the Sudanese armed forces, they're basically kind of sticking their head in the sand a bit and refusing to acknowledge how bad the situation is for them. But also, I, I feel that we're not anywhere near close to a peace deal because of just the sheer complexity and the number of different actors involved from outside. The problem is that you've got multiple forums and discussions going on at the same time. And this kind of leads to complete fracturing and a sense of kind of listlessness. And so I think what the international community and particularly Europe and the US needs to do is they need to be pressuring the Emiratis hard to stop backing Hemeti to the hilt. But you see, the problem with that is that maybe in normal times that could maybe happen. But with what's going on in Israel right now, no one is going to be using up any bartering power with the Emiratis or the Gulf states. Israel is the primary focus and Sudan's a bit of an afterthought. So they don't want to be using up any of their points with Abu Dhabi or with Riyadh. So by now, I think you're probably aware that this conflict is becoming much, much bigger than just Sudan. And even though this conflict doesn't seem to get nearly the international press that it probably deserves, we're now seeing Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Ukraine, Libya, Chad, Russia, and Kenya all thrown into the mix of this conflict. But what are all these sides hoping to get out of the fighting here? Why are they picking one side over the other? And why have a lot of these nations chosen to make this the next crucial battlefield for the region? Well, to answer all of that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2 a magnet for meddling. I think it's important to remind everybody that neither RSF or RSF are popular. This is not a civil war where you have popular support on both sides. Both of these military units are despised by the Sudanese population. They did not want this war. This is a war just for power and greed. And there have been 
human rights abuses, there have been you know, ethnic cleansing. You know, they have willfully exploited and extorted their own country for this political objective that they have. Joe Siegel is the Director of Research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, with his specialization being in the security and development, as well as the role of external actors, including Russia and the Gulf states, within the politics of North and East Africa. Prior to joining the Africa Center, he was also the Douglas Dillon Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and a Senior Research Scholar at the University of Maryland's Center for International and Security Studies, as well as a Senior Advisor for Democratic Governance at the DAI, and for more than a decade, he served in various field capacities throughout Africa, Asia, and the Balkans, with numerous international NGOs, including World Vision and the Peace Corps Volunteers. So we're thrilled to have him on the program today. Most urban warfare isn't about having the heavy artillery or the air power. It's really about having the troops on the ground. And the RSF, uh, in many ways, is more experienced it had deployed into Yemen and had been fighting in that war for many years. And also, and in some ways, the RSF is better equipped because of the revenue flows that the RSF has been gaining from its trafficking of gold from mostly Western Sudan, but parts of Northern Sudan as well. And so it's had a very steady revenue flow that has allowed it to purchase up-to-date small arms, light weapons, and their forces are well equipped for the sort of ground combat that has been going on in Sudan. They have not hesitated from going into civilian areas and using civilian populations as a shield. So that has in many ways negated the artillery and air power that the staff have had. One of the added complications to this conflict is that Sudan, even before all these countries got involved, actually had a fairly decent domestic arms production capacity themselves. And before the war, this industry was mostly owned and operated by the SAF, with some of these factories now becoming battlegrounds within this conflict. So before this conflict reached the stage it did, how do you think this domestic arms production and the access to weapons and ammunition and grants contributed to the escalation of the war and possibly the future of whoever owns these production facilities at the end of the war? In recent years, Sudan has been developing a manufacturing capacity this was supported by collaboration with Iran earlier on, but over the years, it's been managed by the Sudanese, and they were even negotiating to have some exports of mostly small arms, light weapons through other parts of Africa. So yes, there is some indigenous capacity, though with the contracting economy that we've seen in Sudan in recent years, the ability to maintain that supply chain and maintain the ability to deliver, I think, has been constrained. Now, obviously, a lot of the weapons being used in this conflict will have been either manufactured before the war or have been probably on the continent for decades, noting the massive influx of weapons into the continent during the Cold War. But some of the weapons we're seeing at the moment, like the NTM missiles we're seeing in use by the RSF, are new to this theater. So who is actually bringing in most of these weapons? The understanding is that because of the previous ties, UAE, given their, their support in Yemen, as well as RSF's ties to Russia, who have been collaborators in the trafficking of gold out of Sudan, that, that those are the main interlocutors for bringing weapons in through the Gulf countries, primarily you know, the Russians through the Wagner Group, have bases in Libya. They also have bases in Central African Republic. And so there have been reports that there have been some weapon flows from Libya and Central African Republic into Western Sudan controlled by the RSF. And that is the logic, uh, understanding right now how the RSF remains relatively better supplied than the SAF. So we'll come back to Russia and Wagner in a bit, as I'm hoping to cover a lot of the actors and their motivations here in the conflict. But I think a good place to start when looking at all these actors is probably the UAE were one of the major players here in this theater. So why is the UAE involved in this conflict and what are the overall strategic goals here? The UAE is trying to become a regional power and as part of that, it is a go-to place for financial transactions and a hub for illicit trafficking of gold. And that's one of the exports that Sudan has and that's one of the main revenue sources for the RSF. And so the expectation is that a lot of that is flowing through UAE. And so on that front, the UAE would like to maintain that financial 
partnership that it has with RSF. The UAE also sees itself as a regional and a growing power in North East Africa. And so there have been a series of countries in which it has been competing for influence up and down the Red Sea, up into Libya, and so vying to make itself an indispensable partner, a key power in Sudan, would be a major foreign policy success for the UAE. And that's part of the worry that we have for Sudan, that you have a number of regional actors that are circling Sudan that don't have Sudan's interest at heart, but are looking at ways that they could carve up Sudan for their own regional advancement. And Sudan's a very attractive target in that way. It's a huge country in terms of land mass. It borders seven other African countries. It borders the Red Sea. It straddles between the Arab world and Africa. And so it's an attractive place for the UAE, a small country in the Gulf, to be the, the kingmaker. And so I think that political dimension is also one of the drivers for why the UAE has been such a strong supporter of RSF. And from my understanding, this relationship between the two has been going on for a while, with the UAE regularly hiring RSF fighters for use within their past campaigns into Yemen and Libya in particular. But another actor involved in the conflict here that has a complicated relationship with the government is Russia, who in the past have had a close relationship with the SAF and Bashir, but are currently back in the RSF in this round of fighting. So can you take us through what Russia's aims are here and why they've chosen to back the RSF on this one? Well, Sudan provides a number of attractive features for Russia, and key among those is its strategic location. The Russians have been trying to gain naval port access both in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea for a number of years. And so they've had some very advanced negotiations with the Sudanese military to set up a long-term naval port agreement. And this has been close to finalization at various points. Having that naval port access would provide the Russians an opportunity to further demonstrate that it remains a great power who has interest all over the world. In a practical way, it would allow the Russians to potentially interdict and at least aggravate other maritime traffic happening through the Red Sea and including naval act activity that NATO or others might be undertaking in a time of crisis. So Port Sudan is a key factor there and it makes other countries in the region and the West very nervous because that would, you know, would have broader geostrategic implications. Russia is also interested because it has been using Africa as a theater to try and inflate its importance and its geostrategic posture vis-a-vis the West. You know, Russia's been under sanctions, it's been isolated. So to the extent that Russia can continue to operate and be seen as a key player to travel unhindered around the world, basically thumb its nose at, at those sanctions and say, listen, we're still welcomed in other places. And so we've seen over the last couple of years, and it's accelerated since the Russian invasion in Ukraine, that Russia has become more active in Africa. They're usually not investing much, but they have gained more traction politically, and they have been the key supporter of the various coups we've seen in the Sahel, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. They, of course, have had longstanding ties in Libya. They have been the biggest supporters in the Central African Republic with Faustine Toadera. They, in fact, provide his presidential guard, and there's a Russian national security advisor. So Libya and Central African Republic border Western Sudan, who the Russians have been supporting. And so from a geographic and geostrategic standpoint, Sudan's a very attractive place for the Russians because it would basically connect their proxy support all the way from Western Africa across the Sahel all the way to the Red Sea. And again, elevate their posture as being a global power. The Wagner-controlled gold mines in particular have also proven themselves incredibly useful for Russia, as the Russians can export that gold to the UAE for production and resale onto the wider markets and get paid for doing so in completely unsanctioned USD, a big necessity for the Russian armed forces at the moment. In fact, these operations here in Sudan were viewed as so important to the Russians that the Ukrainians earlier this year actually deployed some of their special forces into Sudan to go after those Russian gold mines, directly firing upon RSF and Wagner forces. 
although in the end they were unsuccessful in completely dislodging the Russians and RSF from the area, and the Ukrainian special forces would return home quickly. But looking at the other side of the conflict now, Egypt has probably been the biggest backer and supporter of the SAF, or the Sudanese armed forces. So what is Egypt hoping to get out of all this? Egypt's in a very challenging place because you have the crisis in Gaza, which is attracting most of its attention. But there have been nearly 400,000 Sudanese refugees who've poured across the border in the south from Sudan. Egypt definitely sees Sudan as part of its near region. And Egypt has been a backer of maintaining military government in Sudan, even with the push for democratic reform and transition there. And so maintaining that model in Sudan has been a priority for the Egyptians. But Egypt is worried that the Gulf actors may be moving in, that they could be gaining more control at the expense of Egypt, and it makes them very nervous. At the same time, you know, Egypt has been facing very difficult economic times largely because of the mismanagement of the economy by the CC regime. And so they're not in as strong a position economically to do as much as they might want to do in Sudan. And so Egypt is an actor that would very much like to see this conflict resolved diplomatically. Unlike some of the others, Egypt's interest aligned with Sudan's interest in terms of maintaining a stable state and maintaining a unified state of Sudan. And now looking at Egypt's other major border, Libya is also a major player to take into consideration here. Although when I say Libya, I'm mostly referring to the Benghazi-based government currently controlling the eastern half of Libya, this government being led by Khalifa Haftar, who himself in his civil war was also being backed by the Russians and the UAE. And throughout the conflict has had a close relationship with the RSF, hiring thousands of their fighters quite regularly to bolster his forces' front lines, as well as act as shock troops against the Tripoli-based Libyan forces. In fact, from some of the reports we have here, there are still quite a few RSF troops stationed in Libya at the moment. So do you think Haftar will look to return the favour and help Hameti here? Or do you suppose that in fear of raising tensions with Egypt, he might only choose to stay minimally involved in this conflict? Well, to be clear, the conflict in Libya is spilling over into Sudan, and it's why what happens in Libya is so important for the region, because with the Russians and Haftar, they've tried multiple times to seize Tripoli by force. The expectations will try again, and so if he were to be installed, it would be a source of instability for the region. Vis-a-vis -vis Egypt, Egypt has been a, a supporter of Haftar, and I think here's where Haftar's interest in Sudan are different than Egypt. Egypt, as I mentioned, really would want to see Sudan stabilized. I don't think Haftar is prioritizing stability in Sudan. I think Haftar would look at Sudan as a potential source of revenues in terms of the gold or controlling some of the agricultural assets. It may be a source of fighters. So again, Haftar's interest align with the Russian interest. So Haftar would be willing to take more risk in Sudan at the behest of the Russians. And so I think definitely he is somebody that we need to keep an eye on in terms of as a potential spoiler in Sudan. So what about a multilateral organization like the European Union, the African Union, or even the UN? Could you say a foreign deployed peacekeeper force potentially being the answer to this conflict here? The West has also been the main provider of humanitarian assistance, development assistance under military government. And the West is very intent and supportive of providing humanitarian assistance now. Uh, the problem is access. Even in the last couple of weeks, we've heard of attacks on humanitarian convoys. So I think it's a question of what can be done at this point. And uh, a lot of that focus has been on the diplomatic side. And really, there hasn't been a lot of interest on the part of the warring parties to come to agreement, I think, particularly from Hameti. But I do believe for the Sudan conflict to be resolved and for us to see stability return, we are going to need to see a peacekeeping force come in. It may be a UN force, it may be an African Union force, because the Russians may block a UN force. But there was a UN force in Darfur for many years, UNAMID, that just recently, before the conflict, had phased down. So I think resuming a UNAMID operation in Darfur, you're going to need forces in Khartoum, 
There may need to be forces in the Kordofan area where there's been heavy fighting. There's going to be need to be some forces in, in the east around Port Sudan as a buffer between the SAF and RSF forces. So Sudan is probably a textbook example of a case where peacekeeping forces are really an essential element to moving from a place of conflict and instability to, to one of stability and then allowing a transition to a full-time sovereign government in Sudan. However, it should be said that we haven't seen any concrete moves to go down that road yet. And with that in mind, where do you see this conflict going in the near future? It's hard to say. Once a conflict unfolds, and especially one as fragmented as Sudan, where it goes could be anyone's guess. It's kind of like a spinning top. Once it loses control, it can spin in any direction. That's the real worry. The longer that this goes, the more you're going to see regional actors circle around Sudan and look for opportunities to carve it up rather than to stabilize the country. So I think that's the question. How quickly can those interested in stabilizing Sudan put diplomatic pressure on the military actors to agree to a ceasefire and to a transition before things do fragment and then it becomes highly unlikely that Sudan will be reconsolidated as as a unified state. To do that, we are going to need to see more intensive diplomatic pressure from the UN, from the West, which is seen as an honest broker in Sudan relative to regional actors. It's going to have to be very clearly communicated to especially Hameti that he will not be recognized as the head of state of Sudan, even if he were to prevail. I think he has that vision that if he can prevail militarily, that ultimately the international community is going to come around and recognize him. So it's important that international actors be very clear that regardless of what happens in the battlefield, Hemeti will not be recognized. And as part of that, there needs to be a push for exit strategies for Hemeti and for Burhan to leave the country. This would entail some sort of combination of carrot and, stick, and sticks, including you know, ICC arrest warrants for crimes against humanity and, and war crimes in Sudan, really removing the top layer of the militaries on each side who are really political actors, then creates opportunity to move this back into a more solvable situation. And we need to remember that there is an active civilian network. There are ex-government officials There are civil society organizations. There's a long history, actually, of grassroots communities and and reformers that have been formed in Sudan. It's one of the things that makes Sudan unique to the other conflicts we're seeing in Africa. People are organized. They want democracy. And so often overlooked in this conflict, because we're focusing on the two warring factions, is that there's a vibrant civilian element here. And so I think that's really the way that we get to stability is to empower the civilians. And that may be the most palatable second choice of the military, that they're not going to be in power, then the civilians would be in power. So it's going to require a strong diplomatic push, but that is going to be far less costly than uh, letting Sudan spiral out of control into an ongoing festering conflict like we've seen in Yemen for so many years. So since last year, the conflict seems to have now flipped on its head, and the stagnation we saw during summer till all but disappeared, with the RSF now on the move, backed with everything from anti-air missiles to Wagner mercenaries, and the SEF seeming to be increasingly unprepared for the storm coming their way. So what happens if the RSF actually does continue down this march? Will it mean an easy victory for Moscow or Abu Dhabi? Or are the realities of an offensive campaign about to catch up with the RSF? And the fighting is about to become much more entrenched and much more difficult. Well, to find that out, we turn to our final guest. Part 3. The Persistent Purgatory This is a war that's very quickly forced the capital of the country to become an urban warfare zone, to suffer airstrikes from its own military. So unlike even some of the other mega crises, there's no ministries, telecommunications, banking, most of the industry for the country, all gone, plundered, destroyed. 
and the leadership and diplomatic missions to the country also evacuated. It's a unique and just very cruel situation for what we're seeing in Sudan. Will Carter is the country director for the Norwegian Refugee Council, specialising in the political and aid dynamics within Sudan. Will has been critical in quite a number of programs here in Sudan, and having also run programs in countries like Afghanistan, is well aware of how many of these patterns unfold. So we're thrilled to have him on the program today. We've seen a big swing to urban warfare, and traditionally the Sudanese armed forces are mechanized and have some air power. The equipment for them is, is outdated, you know, T-72 tanks and other sort of pretty aged material, but they do have heavy weaponry in their arsenals. By contrast, the Rapid Support Forces, which was really brought to prominence in Darfur and used very mobile desert warfare vehicles with machine guns and PGs is what characterizes most of their weaponry and fighting force. So they're able to seize cities and there's been little stopping them. Immediately, the country started bombing its own capital, trying to slow or arrest that progress, but with little else to really lead any counteroffensives. Both sides have supposedly had access to some drone technology, but only makeshift drones really for the RSF and then manufactured drones for the Sudanese armed forces, but not really used in great numbers just yet. So Burhan is currently flying all around the world trying to gain more support and recognition for his government, particularly from countries in Europe. But what kind of standing does his government and the SAF actually have at the moment? In October 2021, the civilian prime minister for the country in a transitional government was ousted and the military seized control and not put any civilians in. So many diplomats might you know, describe this to be a military junta. Some would still accredit this to be as this, you know, the sovereign state, but not necessarily a legitimate government. Now they've lost their seat of power in, in Khartoum, set up a de facto administrative capital in the northeast of the country. And they've been trying to appeal both for international political support and presumably to attract military aid and other forms of support to them as well. Very few actors in the regional world want to see a Libya scenario, you know, divided states, fragmented states in this way. So they've been pressing to get more support to prevent that outcome. But it doesn't look like there's been too many allies for them in this regard. And for some of their staunchest allies in the past have been disappointed or dismayed at how quickly they've been crumbling. So they're trying to play a political and diplomatic hand, and it's not really progressed that well. On the converse, we have a militarily stronger opponent, the Rapid Support Forces, who, although they can expand their coverage, I think know in their heart of hearts that they don't have the civic or governance capacity to do this. They're not actually looking for a, a full military solution, not as their as a primary objective. They really, I think, wanted a political solution where they presumably would have immunity, uh, come back into the political fold, take leadership positions in whatever the next phase of the state is. Although what's happened in the last few months, I think it would be very difficult to see any of this happen. The RSF has really crossed the Rubicon in terms of taking this last city in Wad Madani, just southeast of the capital, because it's not traditionally their heartland. This sort of demonstrates that they can take more and more territory. And I think that will continue to, to pressure the constituencies and the leadership that the Sudanese armed forces have. So we'll see if that buckles. So obviously things have spiraled out of control at the moment, and most would argue that it's now nearly impossible to put the toothpaste back into the tube. But do you think there was ever a point in this conflict where outside actors could have stepped in and helped either defuse the situation or even just contain the fighting rather than letting it spread as far and wide across the country as it has? So I think there was a moment at the beginning where a regional power like Egypt could have nipped this in the bud quite quickly before part two was lost. But it feels like now the horse is bolted. Now it's it's kind of too late to control. And like, you know, speaking with Egyptian officials, I get the sense that they, they feel an impending national security issue for them, much more than they're concerned about the outcome of the country. And so there's a lot of interest now in trying to contain the security crisis on certain borders. So the capacity to limit influences from certain Gulf states and to control the stakeholders of both sides of them will be very, very difficult. But we haven't really seen the hand of either side be strengthened enough to achieve the victories they want. We've seen the other side is strong enough to win, but they're also not weak enough to completely lose. Although 
militarily, it looks like it's heading that way with the Sudanese armed forces. The last civil war in Sudan between the majority Islamic North and the majority Christian South ended with a referendum in the South of Sudan and the creation of a new state, South Sudan. Now, I am the first to point out that whilst this did end most of the fighting between Khartoum and Juba, the capital of South Sudan, it did start the South Sudanese civil war when internal groups, particularly the Dinka and the Nuwa, went to war with each other over who would rule South Sudan. So whilst it did bring some sort of peace, it, it was a somewhat mixed peace. Now when it comes to North Sudan though, I have seen some suggestions floated online about trying to end this war with a similar outcome, granting a state like Darfur independence from the rest of Sudan, or even splitting Sudan in half and giving half of the country to the RSF. But can you take us through why that may have some unintended consequences for the country and the people living in it down the road? Secession of South Sudan at the time was seen as a, a political victory, but clearly the country years ahead now hasn't been able to progress. There's been some sort of fundamental issues which were never solved. So in, in some ways, it, it's not necessarily seen as, as a standard to aspire to. The rapid support forces, so far in, the, in their rhetoric or positioning, they're not liberation or fighters for Darfur, um, even though that's where most of the constituency or, or membership comes from. Um, they're not necessarily fighting for you know, devolution or secession in any way. But they're still looking at a, at, a, at a national level rather than a subnational level. And from that side, I don't think that would be an easy way to resolve. There are quite large concerns at the moment that this conflict here in Sudan has the potential to have much more damaging repercussions right across this region, as currently the neighborhood is already experiencing a fair bit of turmoil, even before we start looking at the fallout from Sudan. I mean, just going through the states the Sudan borders one by one, Egypt, Kenya, and Eritrea have all got economic and political problems at the moment, as well as parts of their country looking to declare independence. And Ethiopia, South Sudan, Central African Republic, Chad, and Libya all have ongoing civil wars within their territory as well, pushing a lot of their institutions much further than they should probably be pushed. To some of these cases, near the brink of collapse. Now, when we had a country as big as Sudan going into civil war, with its 40 million plus potential refugees that might look to flee into any of these neighboring states if the conflict does potentially get worse, it does seem that we're setting ourselves up for a bit of a regional domino effect to come along. Is that a concern that you share as well? As we saw from West Africa, there is clearly a possibility for a domino effect for one coup in one country and suddenly you've got three, four, five coup d'etats all in the same neighbourhood. With the armed conflicts in East Africa, state institutions, many of them are running thin on funds, on support. There's a very diminished international community capacity here. At the same time, everyone's poorer post-COVID. Some of the things that have been preventing the fragmentation within some of these states are now gone for, for different reasons. And so certainly in, in very large and diverse countries like Somalia or Ethiopia or indeed Sudan, we've seen this fragmentation with the weak central governments unable to really manage the stakeholders there. And I see Sudan is connected to a lot of very unstable regions, not just countries, but the, all the borderland areas in Amhara or Tigray regions of Ethiopia, of Upper Nile states in South Sudan, Eastern Chad, Qatar, Libya. These are all the states of the neighbor are, are unstable. And so from our point of view, there's a, there's a huge risk of regional destabilization as the situation, the crisis and conflict in Sudan isn't being managed appropriately. Now, admittedly, there are some actors here in the region who are seeing these warning signs and have been trying to broker a peace deal between the two sides here. But none of these peace deals seem to be coming to anything concrete because rather than having one big peace summit with everyone at the table, most of the actors here are actually supporting their own version of peace talks. These talks usually being sponsored by the nations backing each side of the conflict, being pretty transparently done to hope for better terms for their side. And quite often when you have one side sponsoring all the peace talks, the other side refuses to attend the talks, meaning, frankly, that nothing gets done. So realizing that we probably can't look to the UAE or Egypt or any of these sort of countries to solve the problem, is there an avenue like the UN or the African Union where this could potentially be resolved? Clearly, this has been a very neglected crisis. Um, we, we've barely seen any UN Security Council focus on this, any statements or you know, outreach from world leaders on it or even foreign ministers. So it needs to be raised and the stakes need to be much higher for both of the warring parties and their regional backers from both sides that this needs to, to end because we really are on the brink of complete state collapse right now. 
for the Sudanese armed forces and what's left of the, the government, they have to figure out a political space, both for a ceasefire that can be effectuated across not just the capital, but the entire country, and turn to their original promises of eventually a civilian transition, although this may take some time. There may need to be some, some arrangements for peacekeeping if there is a peace to be kept. We might need some kind of military observation if there's a ceasefire agreement. You know, at the moment, there's no UN political mission to observe this, so we may need different formula. You know, we're seeing millions of people displaced and already over a million people as refugees. But if there is famine, if there is ethnic cleansing or genocide, if there is complete state collapse, next year that will be 5, 10 million people leaving the country. There really will be almost nothing left for them in this country of 46, 7, 8 million people. So they need to make sure that humanitarian aid comes in because at the moment there's been a lot of challenges. So having worked in quite a number of these countries and witnessed firsthand what happens when the institutional collapse occurs, what do you see going forward for the future of this conflict? At the moment, most of the scenarios we're considering are bleak, bleaker ones even than what's happened so far. There is an outcome where a ceasefire can be agreed to, which is then implemented across the country. Um, we view that with low likelihood, just from the past experience, the last seven, eight months of this conflict. That's the best case scenario. We are able to stop most of the war fighting. It'll probably still linger on in Darfur and in the Kordofan region with this other military front. So either we can have a continuation of this ascendancy of the RSF increased control, or we can have a counteroffensive from the Sudanese armed forces or some kind of managed withdrawal and recapture of the capital city as part of the progression of the political positioning. The worst outcome is that the rapid support forces go after a full military victory. They've already, in some ways, pushed most of the Sudanese armed forces to the very extremities of the country. If they continue, also sees the reconstituted de facto administrative capital in, in Port Sudan or some of the air bases, which is one of the factors holding current balance of power. If they do any of these things, it's quite possible that whatever is left of the Sudanese state will have collapsed and there's no civic governance. There'll be no economic or political institutions capable of coming into that, that void. And so we'd see a full state collapse. Nothing really controlling the borders, the regional domino effects, huge outflows of people due to famine, due to huge abuses and atrocities. We're on a course where we're preparing for things to get even worse next year. With the international support for this conflict being, frankly, as divided as the country itself, it would suggest that this country is not going to rid itself of civil war anytime soon. And whilst internationally there does seem to be more tacit support for the SAF, particularly among certain diplomats, a lot of this is not because the SAF are trusted actors, but simply because the RSF are being implicated in numerous human rights abuses. With neither the SAF or the RSF representing a group that could either speak for the Sudanese people as a whole, or be trusted not to bring back the same heavy hands that Bashir had brutalized the country with for decades leading up to this point. However, whilst the SAF may justify this by claiming they have a slightly cleaner human rights record than the RSF, and that may be enough for some countries, for others, it does become harder to justify their rule over Sudan when they only govern a small fraction of it, preventing these countries from easily doing business with the rest of Sudan. However, on the opposite side, for the actors who decide that the reality on the battleground should decide everything, I would readily point out that territorial gains really aren't everything, and in Africa, can be quite often temporary. As yes, whilst the RSF may have the battlefield momentum at the moment, they also have very little institutional experience. They also have very little institutional experience. And the areas we've seen them take over and govern are often full of corruption and chaos, as well as allegations of mass graves. If given the reins to Sudan as a whole, it's pretty unclear as to whether they would actually be able to reunify the country under RSF command, or whether the country would simply succumb to the same fate as South Sudan when they were given the reins. That without a unifying external enemy to unite their forces behind, that they might be just as likely to break into civil war themselves. A common occurrence when institutional knowledge and power building is as weak as the RSFs. However, in my personal opinion, I would argue that neither government recognition nor battlefield realities alone are enough to govern a country like Sudan. 
and that governing a country like Sudan requires a lot more than lines on a map or a few good photo ops. Then again, my opinion here shouldn't matter, as it's the Sudanese people who are the ones having all of this done to them, rather than what it should be, which is for them. The Sudanese are watching their country get carved up and divided by international actors, all while knowing that what they wanted, what they fought for and protested for and even died for in these protests, was democratic representation. Speaking to locals on the ground who wanted to remain anonymous, as well as watching the footage from the protests that removed Bashir, one of the unifying factors amongst everyone was that they all just wanted a better life and to live in a period of peace. But instead, outside powers are now talking over the Sudanese people, and without consultation, are deciding which of these strongmen they would prefer to use as their conduit for their own selfish aims here in Sudan. This, in my mind, is the second greatest tragedy of this conflict. As the first, we'll be watching this internal bickering possibly break Sudan and the inevitable fallout that would bring to the region, upending the governments, stabilities, and livelihoods of the 350 million people who inhabit Sudan and its seven neighboring states. Also, one of these two men can simply fulfill their personal desires. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. This one being our last episode of 2023. And what a year it's been, as not only did we release our 100th episode of The Red Line and expanded our already fantastic team, but we also broke ground and kicked off into even bigger projects for The Red Line, one of which you may or may not have already seen. But two weeks ago, we launched our brand new sister channel alongside our friends at Economics Explained called Context Matters. The show is all the same straightforward, data-driven geopolitical analysis, but with great animations, maps, and videos for those of you who are not quite as geopolitically nerdy as I am. Now, we first talked about it on the show two weeks ago, and I am absolutely blown away with the messages and support the channel has received so far. And to everyone who's already subscribed or watched a couple of videos, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. But to anyone else who hasn't checked it out yet, I would love it if you could go over, give it a like, or subscribe, or just tell me what you think of the one or two jokes they let me sneak into the script. Regardless of which though, all of this has been a long time in the works, and I'm thrilled to be bringing more content to you guys on top of everything we do. As right now, we're not only putting out The Red Line, but we're also putting out top-tier Patreon-only content that frankly we're also really proud of, as well as some absolutely amazing analysis articles written by my team, and an upcoming mini-series I'm really excited to talk about that we'll be releasing early next year with all of this coming on top of the regular Redline show, as even after five years, I still enjoy putting this show together and going far deeper into a subject than I'd usually find online. So with all of those projects coming up and everything else we've seen from 2023, we're very much expecting 2024 to be an even bigger year here at the show. But if you're one of the people who discovered us in 2023, I wanna say thank you for jumping on and hopefully you enjoy all the content we have coming out for you over the next 12 months. Now, if you want to be made aware of all that content we do put out and get notified immediately, you can find all of the info for that on Twitter, Reddit, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Threads, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or if you can to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliot Oz. Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each month to help myself and the team keep this one going. And speaking of our amazing Patreons, this week I want to thank our newest signups. BK, Aiden MC, Miguel Campo, Sean Russell, Anna, Jeremiah Huey, and Sebastian, with the latest patrons to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like these guys, and we cannot thank them enough for all of their help and support of the show. So if you feel you have a couple of dollars you could spare and want access to things like our recent workshop, modeling and unpacking the Taiwan invasion plans, or our crash course giving a full analysis of the makeup and strategic doctrine of the armed forces of Uzbekistan, you can sign up to our Patreon today, links for which are in the description. But for now, this episode on the war in Sudan is all thanks to you guys. Now, whilst we do have our best reads of 2023 list coming out in a few days, there is still the matter of this episode's book list. So as usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Sudan's Unfinished Democracy from the African Arguments series for a look at how local voices are trying to seize the power back for themselves here in Sudan. The second is The Politics of Ethnic Discrimination in Sudan for a look at how ethnicity has been weaponized here in the country. And the third is Sudan, the failure and division of an African state, which does a pretty good job of unpacking the complications within the state 
that exacerbate and continue the problems in the country's trajectory. Also, give a big thanks to this week's guests, Will Brown, Joe Siegel, and Will Carter. This is an episode that we frankly wrote quite a lot of, and then everything on the ground changed, requiring a lot of work and a very quick turnaround for some of these guys to make it work. So I really can't thank them enough for all their help on this one. And on top of that, I want to give a massive thanks to my staff as well, starting with the primary researchers of this piece, being Daniela Juvella, Jamie Tanu, Mason Wise, Isaac Gibbs, Cameron Gale, and Genevieve Doddle May. Sudan is just one of those topics that you really do have to try and unpack and understand 40 years of detailed political history in order to just understand the basics for today. So it took a lot of work from this research team to make this episode work. And again, can't thank him enough for it. I'd also like to thank Cameron Gale, the producer, Barry Grace, Daniela Juvella, Genevieve Donald and May, Nato Silla, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, Scott Missler Ferguson, Jemima Bentreath, Ben Nutter, Mason Wise, Gabrielle Lane, Lorenz Van Kielabilk, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tano, our MD director, Raul Devan Ryanan, our OSIN analyst, Francis Leach, our director of breaking news, Mark Spencer, our second voice of our artist, Kashyap Maheshwari from our online team, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick March, our field correspondent. Every single one of the wins we've had this year is all thanks to this team. And I look forward to having even more wins alongside this amazing bunch of people next year. So for the final time in 2023, I'm happy to say that the Red Lion will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.